I'm so delighted to have Happy Mammoth as a self-work sponsor. We're only just beginning to understand the vital role that hormonal stability and regulation plays in our mental health. I had a doctor look at me the other day and say, oh, I leave that hormonal stuff to the OBGYNs, and I just shook my head. So sometimes you have to advocate for yourself, and that's where hormone harmony comes into play. Happy Mammoth is the company that created Hormone Harmony, which is not just a supplement for women going through perimenopause, menopause, or postmenopause, but is dedicated to making all women's lives easier no matter what time of life you're in now. They make no compromise when it comes to quality, and it shows. You can join thousands of women who are so very happy with what Hormone Harmony is doing for them. For a limited time, you can get 15% off your entire first order at happymammoth.com. Just use the code SELFWORK at checkout. That's happymammoth.com and use the code SELFWORK for 15% off today. This is SELFWORK and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we discuss psychological and emotional issues and what you can do about them, whether that's learning self-acceptance, taking action, or seeking therapy or treatment. Eight years ago, I extended the walls of my practice to reach those of you who might already be knowledgeable about mental health treatment, but also to those of you who might say, you'd never darken the door of a therapist. And yet, you are here. I'll answer your questions while I invite you to take a few minutes for your own self-work but there was one day where she heard him delivering drugs to a child when he didn't realize his phone that she provided for him by the way was on I've got to begin to detach I'll always love him but I can't worry constantly about him the drugs have changed him and he's become someone I don't know welcome to this week's edition of self-work The term distancing in the last few years has come to mean something quite different, as many were social distancing from one another during the pandemic, while many others struggle with loneliness and sadness from that very choice. But today we're going to focus on emotional detachment and distancing in a way that's more healthy. When I began self-work eight years ago, my goal was to share what I'd learned from doing therapy for decades with people of all walks of life who were podcast listeners, who maybe couldn't afford therapy or were very dubious about that whole thing. I've invited comments, both positive and negative, and haven't ever blocked anyone from responding unless they were so disrespectful that I felt like I was allowing someone to literally walk all over me. And I've definitely received criticism, which is okay. But today I'm going to bring forward a harsh criticism of a blog post on unconditional love that I wrote years ago, after having the experience with both parents and their now adult children of them needing to distance themselves from family, sometimes painfully, sometimes with relief. I'll have the blog post link in the show notes. Obviously, I won't read the whole thing, but I'm curious if I bring this comment into the self-work space where it will lead. Today's listener email is from a woman from Poland who writes to tell me why she listens and all her life she's been scared about the schizophrenia that runs in her family. I've not seen too many people with schizophrenia during my practice, so my experience is limited. I've seen more people who have a loved one, a son or a brother, for example, that is schizophrenic. She also talks about detaching from an alcoholic dad, but could only allow herself to do that just this past year. I'm always so touched when someone takes the time to write, and I'd love to hear from you. Right now, let's hear from BetterHelp. BetterHelp has long been a sponsor of self-work and a great one. And of the several online therapies out there, they by far have the most highly rated. In fact, I looked it up to make sure, and Forbes has BetterHelp rated more highly over both Talkspace and online therapy, the other major online providers. Now, you might be asking yourself, so why would any good clinician want to work for an online service? Let me tell you, those clinicians don't have to take care of all the business details, the paperwork, the insurance filing, the scheduling service, none of it. I myself have been approached by BetterHelp several times to join their network. And when I saw the benefits, frankly, if I hadn't already had too much on my plate, I would have joined You can communicate through text, chat, video, or phone, whatever is most convenient and works for you. And the number one problem that so many people face when considering therapy, that problem is taken care of for you. What is it? How do I find someone? The BetterHelp website asks you questions, you answer them, 
and then they find a therapist that fits best for you in your area. If you have one session and don't get much out of it, all you have to do is let them know and the process starts over again. It's private, professional, convenient, and affordable. These are licensed professionals, someone who's put years into their training so that they can best help you. And so much of the hassle is taken care of for you. They now have 35,000 clinicians in their network, up from 25,000. So now is your time to choose BetterHelp. And if you use this link, betterhelp.com slash selfwork, you'll get 10% off your first month of sessions. It's betterhelp.com slash selfwork. I promise you, good therapy helps. I know. I've been there. It helped me, and it can help you. As I said in the intro, coming online with my thoughts and beliefs about mental health issues hasn't always been sunshine and roses. I wrote a post called When a Parent's Unconditional Love is Worn Away. The link is in your show notes. I also think I followed that up with a podcast. That will be two in your show notes. What I was writing about is what I'd seen over the years and something you've probably seen as well. That certain kids did great, what are called resilient kids in the literature, even when they were raised by really bad parents who took no responsibility and offered no safety. Somehow, those kids made it through, whereas maybe even their siblings may not have been so lucky. Yet the opposite dynamic also existed. Parents who'd done a fairly decent job, not perfect, but decent, and took responsibility for their mistakes, even tried to fix them, may have ended with an adult child who developed some kind of personality disorder, a bad addiction, or who created chaos in their lives that their parents didn't understand. And those parents were left feeling somewhat helpless, but were actually still trying to help. The post and subsequent podcast episode were trying to highlight this very painful dilemma of loving, but no longer being able to love unconditionally, or having to put up some guardrails so that you couldn't be manipulated or used, or frankly at times, to protect your other children. I also said that sometimes it's also the child or the adult child who must do that distancing with their parent or parents. When their parent once again tries to manipulate or blame or use them, they must also draw boundaries. For anyone in the throes of doing this, of detaching and distancing from someone you've grown wary of, it can be painful. I said in the piece that it could be a kind of death, death of the relationship as you thought or hoped it would be. I remember one of the moms I was thinking of as I wrote the post. Her about 40-year-old son had bipolar disorder, severe, and had developed bad addictions while living on the streets of a major metropolitan city here in the U.S. She was actually thankful when he was in jail because she knew he was probably eating and had somewhere to sleep. She sent him to multiple rehabs, had sent money, had searched for him herself. Her love for him was intense. But it's also true she could talk about the mistakes she thought she'd made, and she felt great remorse for those. But there was one day where she heard him delivering drugs to a child when he didn't realize his phone, that she provided for him, by the way, was on. I've got to begin to detach. I'll always love him, but I can't worry constantly about him. The drugs have changed him, and he's become someone I don't know. This very complicated dynamic I'd heard before, and I wanted to talk openly but carefully about it. One reader was very critical, going so far as to say that the article and me as the author obviously had severe blind spots or that I was judgmental toward, quote, very vulnerable people, and he cast doubt on my ability to be a psychologist. His comment has been on the post for months, but for some reason today I wanted to address some of his criticism. He's right. There are plenty of people who tell therapists like me that they, quote, did their very best. And frankly, what they did or didn't do or provide was pretty bad. When someone is in front of me who I can see and feel in the room is frankly bullshitting me or trying to, then I'll address that as best I can. Could I miss something? Of course. And yes, He's also right. There are many reasons why a child reared in a lack of safety or affirmation or downright abuse can become an adult whose life is riddled with chaos and poor choices. There's a very direct line between the past and the present. 
my writing about perfectly hidden oppression is all about that. But do parents lie about that? Of course. Most of the time, interestingly, my job is to help people stop denying that their homes weren't perfect. They'll say, oh, my house was perfect. It was just fine. They don't want to say their parents or grandparents were abusive. That kind of denial can lead to horrible self-esteem because the child takes on the responsibility for what was bad or the abuse. But here's what I'm wrestling with. Is there never a good enough reason for a parent or an adult child to detach? Not necessarily abandon, but detach. For example, an adult child could say, you may be my biological parent, but you've never been a real parent to me, and I'm distancing myself from you. Or, of course, whatever the hurt is. But that situation, again, is no gimme. I've certainly worked with adult children who run into disdain from others for doing just that, especially if their parent is ill. What kind of understanding do we have of a parent doing that? I think I understand this reader's anger. He believes I'm falling in with parents who tell themselves, well, we tried hard, we did our best, that that's somehow always okay. That they can divorce themselves emotionally from the destructive trajectory they see their child taking, and that that's okay too. Understandable and quite all right. That parents can abandon their own responsibility for being a part of shaping all of their children. And that that's okay. That denial, that abandonment is just fine. Of course I don't believe that's right. And it's certainly far from good or good enough parenting. But I've also been involved with parents who would put lots of effort and love into their adult child, perhaps to the point of enabling the bad behavior. When they do this, when they detach, it could actually help everyone in the long run because it forces the creation of a new dynamic. But sadly, that doesn't always happen, but it can. So let's take a break and we'll be back in just a moment. Let's talk about a Do you and your partner text all day, but mostly about who's going to pick up, who's going to get groceries? We can so often fall into these habits, even when it may look like you're communicating. That's where the Paired app comes in. This is how it works. You and your partner both download the app, pair together, and the app will take care of it from there. Every day, Paired gives you personalized questions, quizzes, and games to stay connected, deepen your conversations, and have fun. The best part is that you can't see your partner's answer until you answer yourself. Often prescribe something similar to this for couples, where they have time to respond rather than react. Whether you're just a few dates in or have been together a long time, find the time to connect with your partner and nourish your relationship. With the Paired app, it's easy and fun, and it only takes five minutes a day. Head to Paired.com slash self-work to get a seven-day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to Paired.com slash self-work to sign up today. Emotional detachment and distancing in general. When are they appropriate and even necessary? First, let's talk about what is emotional detachment. It's not not caring, and it's not abandonment. What it is, is not allowing your emotions to govern your choices or behavior. It's staying as thoughtful and mindful and objective as you can, and you make decisions from that place, not an overly emotional or impulsive one. It makes sense, but it's often hard to do. So when is it a good idea? Number one. When expressed boundaries or basic respect for those boundaries isn't given. Here's an example from my own life. The first time my in-laws were going to keep my toddler son overnight, the only thing me and my husband asked was for them to please not use the old, literally (laughs) 50-year-old, playpen. It had been my husband's as a child, and there was lead in the paint. The first thing we saw when we walked in the next morning was my mother-in-law smiling, pointing her finger at my son and saying he loved the playpen. And he was holding up his arms, smiling and laughing from the playpen. Now, were we being overprotective? Some might say so, but it was the one thing we'd asked. I didn't voice anger with them, nor did my husband. What I'd learned right then was that they weren't going to honor my husband's and my requests, nor the choices my husband and I might make. So what did we do? We more carefully monitored that relationship, knowing that our wishes weren't going to be followed if they disagreed with us. We emotionally detached. Now, sadly, they weren't the kind of folks we could have a more open conversation with and maybe talk this out. However, they kept enjoying a good relationship with their grandson, and we took care of our boundaries. 
Here's the second example of when emotional detachment is helpful. When someone won't take any responsibility for their hurtful actions or their impact on you or others. These are folks that are more than happy to act as if they don't have a clue why you're upset or what the problem is. They could be lying to themselves, but they certainly are not healthy enough to apologize or admit their mistakes, or even to try to see the impact of their actions or inaction. That's a basic lack of empathy, maybe self-centeredness or other problems, alcoholism, any addictions that could be present as a part of their lives, and they're in denial about that addiction. This is also a basic dynamic with several of the personality disorders, that dynamic being a lack of empathy. It's often a trait of borderline, narcissistic, and certainly antisocial personality disorder. So if that's what you're experiencing with someone else or suspect you are, emotional detaching is the most recommended approach. When you try hard to stay, as the folks in dialectical behavior therapy might say, in your wise mind and not in your emotional mind. If you want more info on that, I'll add a link on DBT in the show notes. I did an episode on it. Here's number three, when there's been a pattern of having a honeymoon with many I'm sorry's and that'll never happen again, but it does. This is a frequent pattern with abuse. There's usually blame that goes along with the honeymoon being over. If you just hadn't talked to me that way, if you just left me alone, whatever the justification for the harm done. You do have to be careful about emotionally distancing if the situation is truly abusive because threatening to leave or trying to leave can actually be dangerous. But this pattern can happen in a much less dramatic form in other kinds of relationships. In fact, it occurs frequently with people or a couple who may both be somewhat addicted to a kind of roller coaster relationship. Now, detaching from that can be hard as you struggle with feelings like things being boring without all those ups and downs. But deciding, I don't want to ride that roller coaster anymore, might change the relationship. Of course, it also might end the relationship. Here's number four, when you need a break from neediness. This, very plainly put, is putting some distance between you and someone who's either grown into being needy or that you both have realized, maybe even collaboratively, that one of you depends too much on the other. And some time away from the relationship or emotionally detaching or distancing from the relationship might be a healthy thing. People can get lost sometimes in a relationship, and sometimes taking a break from it helps both people recommit to the things that are important to them as individuals. This dynamic is often called codependence and is a situation where both people may decide that some distancing for a while is a good idea so that both can better understand the impact that the relationship is having on each of them. And here's number five. When others that you love and need to protect are being affected by the chaos. Now, this one is very hard to do. It can happen when you realize that other members of your family are being hurt, perhaps by whatever the chaos is itself. For example, if someone is spending all the money you have, so there's no money for school supplies or food. Or frankly, if you stay so upset all the time about this person who's creating chaos, that you're not involved in other people's lives, other children's lives, other families' lives, because you're so wrapped up with the chaos maker. You may have to detach from the chaos, even if you fear that things will get more chaotic when you back off. In fact, that could often be threatened. So this is a tough situation when you've gotten pulled into the emotional vortex of the person who's creating some chaos, and you're told that you're their only savior. Here's the last one, when you're getting divorced. If you've listened to self-work for a while, you know I talk about emotional divorce being a lot harder than legal divorce, and believe me, it is. This, in many ways, should be a class of detachment unto itself. At the same time that you're sad or angry or relieved or whatever your feelings are about the divorce, you need to be also putting some emotional distance between you and your ex. Lawyers are involved often. Things can get messy. Kids have their own reactions. But the more you get your own emotional reactivity in check, the better off you'll be. Now, it is often a very tough time, and you can be tempted to continue the fight that you fought when you were married. Somehow or another, you decide that that fight was going to have more positive outcomes now that you're divorced. 
My perspective is that if that fight was going to have positive outcomes, you might not be getting divorced in the first place. There's a time for the fighting to end. So detaching emotionally, that's not not feeling, but detaching from the intense emotional communication with your ex or soon-to-be ex. Something else people struggle with is how to detach or distance. Maybe it's someone you're going to see at local sports events or even family get-togethers. You might physically be in the same space, but the relationship has changed, so you act differently. When I first moved to a much smaller community here in Arkansas from Dallas, I worked with many people who were getting difficult divorces. How do I detach when I also have to exchange or talk about the kids? Obviously, lots of contact makes that more difficult, and so does social media. I often recommend not scrolling social media. The detachment is harder when you see their life looking great on Instagram or TikTok. It can also help to let others know that know you both, that things have cooled off. Maybe they know you're divorced, but if it's just a relationship or a friendship that has ended or changed. That way, if you meet up with your former bestie or separated spouse at their home, then they'll understand that there might be a little tension or perhaps you need to leave. Basically, you're trying to avoid any emotional chaos that you might unintentionally or intentionally make. So you ask yourself the question, is what I'm about to do going to create more chaos? If the answer is yes, then you likely need to emotionally distance and detach. Try to see what you're experiencing more objectively and overall, slow down. Here's the listener email for today. She gives me her name and tells me she's from Poland, and I'm now quoting. One of my students told me once about your podcast. The title of it really hooked me in. So one day I began to listen, and now I'm listening to the 20th episode, and I've decided to write you an email. I'm 33 years old this year. Now I'm a patient of a psychiatrist, and I consult with my psychotherapist. I'm taking some medicines for my depression since March of last year. But I had been waiting two years before I visited that psychiatrist because of my mom. She suffers from schizophrenia as well as her two or three sisters do in a sister of mine. I was afraid that I could have become ill if I'd started taking psychiatric medication. Over my whole life, I was concerned about my mental health since my mom didn't take any medicines and my dad left her and went abroad for a job. As a child, I was happy that he left us because he used aggression against me and my mom. He's also addicted to alcohol. I didn't have any confidence to stop being in touch with him at least two or three times until this year. I feel that I need to be confident to live my own life without him in it. Again, we're talking about emotional detachment and distancing, aren't we? I can remember that since I was in primary school, I had a strong desire to be dead. Not to hurt myself, but to die in an accident. Now, almost after one year of treatment, I stopped feeling that. It's like a miracle to me. To sum up, I've had different therapies and I've benefited much from them. I just wanted to say thank you for what you are doing, and I'm looking forward to listening to your other episodes. First, thank you for writing and being a listener. Wow. Actually, my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, is out in Poland, so you might give it a read. Second, I'm so sorry that you've been afraid of developing schizophrenia, which can be a very serious problem to have, dependent on how severe your symptoms are, but it's never good news. And as you point out, it is highly genetic. Now, like most other mental illnesses, it usually develops or emerges from the ages of 17 or 18 to 25. So when you get beyond the age of 24 or 25, you can actually worry a little less about it. Let's touch on what it is. Schizophrenia is a chronic brain disorder that affects less than 1% of the U.S. population. When schizophrenia is active, symptoms can include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, trouble with thinking, and lack of motivation. How active these symptoms are and how they affect your behavior and relationship with others is vital to how well you function. As in all mental illness, schizophrenia is on a spectrum. I certainly understand your fear from an objective standpoint, and I'd hope that your treating psychiatrist knows about your family history and would be very careful with medications for you. Happily, it sounds like seeing a psychiatrist and a therapist has been very helpful to you, so helpful that you now realize 
you can let go. You can detach and distance yourself from your alcoholic, abusive, and abandoning father. I'm honored to be part of your therapy. At 33, you've got much time in front of you to build the kind of life you want and deserve. Thank you so much for being here today. We're moving into Suicide Awareness Month in September. And actually, I believe September 10th is Worldwide Suicide Prevention Day. I smile a little bit at this, not with happiness, but with poignance, because so often in my world, at least, we're dealing with people who think about dying by suicide, sometimes frequently. And as I said in my TEDx, actually, it's not all that uncommon. We need to talk about it. It helps to talk about it. So I've already done the interview, and I'll be bringing you Vince Hafley's story, who actually also has a TEDx. That was the fifth or sixth most listened to or viewed TEDx in 2023 in the entire world. And he talked about suicide and construction workers. That's going to be in a couple of weeks. But please, if you have any questions or concerns about that topic, email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. Or leave me a speak pipe message so I can hear your message in your own words. Again, thank you so much for being here. You're an important part of my life and my work, which really my life and my work are one and the same. Please take very good care of yourself, your loved ones, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.